I was born in 1963. I'm 52 years old. And in 1963, gas per gallon was, what do you think? 29 cents a gallon. In 2014, gas, gas was the average of $2.89 a gallon. In 1963, a new car, which we thought, the only reason I remember this, remember the price is right when you're little kids? You say, it has to be a three or a four. The first number is a three or a four. Now it's a three or a four, but it's an extra digit in there. 1963, a new car cost $3,233. Now the average price of a brand new car is $32,495. 50 years makes a big difference. In 1963, a loaf of bread was 22 cents. 2014, $2.07. A first class stamp in 1963, what do you think? Five cents. Today, it's 49 cents. In 1963, a dozen eggs were 55 cents. In 2014, before the bird flu, it was $1.77, and now it's $2.80. Just for a dozen eggs. 50 years, things change. Now, we don't necessarily see that change. We can look back, and we can see that change. We can look back over our 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and we can look back and say, I remember when, but you didn't see it creeping up. Because change doesn't necessarily happen instantaneously, but change does happen. We can look at the technological stages. Everything is going faster and getting smaller. Everything is getting faster and getting smaller. We, we can look at your little phones, and now we can watch TV on our phones wherever we want to go. I remember my dad's TV was just like big old console that was as wide as it was deep. And it was gigantic, but it, it lasted for like 40 or 50 years. I mean, that thing was a monster. It was archaic. But you know what? The technology now, they can have 50-inch TVs, 2-inch thick, and they can put it in, and it costs less than four or 500 bucks. Technology has gone crazy. Massive changes in technology in the internet. What we have seen is we have looked at it over the last 10 to 15 years and we have grown with that technology. And that technology is going to grow. When we do not embrace the technology, what we're doing is we're sticking our head in the sand and say, I will not embrace that change. We have to embrace that change. But then another thing that changes is our sociological. Our, so our sociological changes, every decision is harder because of multiple choices. Our social skills is sometimes archaic. The, if you remember your TV stations back in 50 years ago, we had ABC, NBC, and CBS, right? And I was the channel changer. Boy, get up and do that. My dad never got up. I was the remote control. That's the way it was. Now, if you have uh, TV Cox or whatever, you have 750 channels, and you get tired of looking at the channels, so you just stop because you have so many channels. Most of them aren't worth watching, but we have so many channels. We have so many choices to make our skills. Dr. Barry Schwartz has written his book titled The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less. Listen to what he says. Choosing something as seemingly simple as shampoo can force you to wade through dozens, even hundreds of brands constantly being asked to make choices. Even about the simplest things forces you to invest time, energy, and no small amount of self-doubt and dread. There comes a point in which choices become debilitating rather than liberating. Don't expect that to change. Over the next decade, we are going to be bombarded with more choices and not less choices. But the worst thing? Changes in our morality. Every value is being challenged. Every value. There is no right and wrong. Every value, every time that our parents said, yes, honesty is the best policy. Do the right thing. Work hard. Do what you should do. Don't let somebody give you a handout. Do what you need to do. Our morality has taken a hit. What we must do is we must go back to understand biblical morality is where God wants us to stand. If we as the body of Christ do not stand for the biblical morality, we are going to stick our head in the sand and we will not see Christ in this culture. We must stand up for biblical morality. Biblical morality. I heard about 
different things of, of a, a little girl in, uh, in Garland, Texas, that she was trying to get uh, tickets to a Hannah, Man, Hannah Montana concert. So she had to write an essay. She, her mom helped her lie about an essay in order about her dad being killed in Iraq in order to get free Hannah Montana tickets. When somebody lies to get something free, that's teaching morality is not true. We, I know we live in a postmodern society where absolute truth does not exist, but we as the body of Christ, we must have absolute truth. Everything, values have been challenged. What we must do is stand for what's taking place. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that I believe Jesus told his disciples you need to change. You need to change in order to have something that Christ wants you to have. In Matthew 18, and at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted or unless you are changed and become as little children, you will no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as the little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples were arguing at the last few days of Jesus' life, they were arguing who's going to be the greatest one. They just walked with Jesus for three years. They saw everything that he had done, and they were arguing who's going to be better. And Jesus looked at them and said, guys, you do not get it. And he pulled up a little child. I would think that child is probably, I look at kindergarten, first grade, maybe second grade. He pulls that little child up, and he gives these preachers a lesson on humility. And he said, guys, this child, unless you have a faith of a child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I believe there's things that are attributed to a child that I believe adults lose out on. And I believe some things that we can learn, that we could take the faith of a child and we can learn and we can grow and we can become better adults if we do more childish things. <laughs> Never let your kids hear you say that. We can become better adults if we do more childish things. Now, how many of us on Christmas morning watched, whether it's our kids or our grandkids, with wide-eyed amusement, opening up their presents, smile on their face, excitement. It was, it, was, it was Christmas morning. And there's something about Christmas morning with a child that is so awesome to watch. The joy, the fun, the peace. And I believe that is one of the things that Jesus is saying. The, the simple things. Let, let's let the children teach adults about true meaning of life. So I listed a few and I think they're good. The first one, to be like a child you must change by the and be excited about the new experiences of life. We, we have to be excited about new experiences of life. You tell a child that you're going on vacation and you're going to Disney World or you're gonna go do something, they are thrilled to death, they're excited. Adults tend to develop patterns which become routines, which become habits, and which become ruts. And you know what a rut is? It is a coffin. When we become so in rut in our routine and we never get out of our routine, we, it has to be this way or the highway and we become dead and we become insensitive to what God wants us to do. A child, in other words, they like to be excited about new experiences. What can we do? 2016 coming up, what can we do? If we do the same thing in 2016 as we did in 2014 and 2015, what good is it? We've already lived there. But if we can have a wide eyes excitement about what can take place. You know, we are dead when we think the past is better than our future. It's going to be different than our past, but it can be better than our past. With new experiences, new opportunities, new challenges, our future. We must be like a little child and look forward to experiencing things that we've never experienced before. Sure, our insecurities say, ah, I don't know if I can do that. Sure, we don't know what we're going to do in a lot of different ways, but that's when we can trust in God and be like that child and say, you know what? I don't know what I don't know. I just know I'm going to do it. I'm going to be excited about it. Experiences. Some of the best things that we could do is remember the experiences of our past and say they were great, but the experiences of my future, what I can do, 
Whether I'm 70 years old or whether I'm 20 years old, I have my life ahead of me, and I want to be excited about the experiences. You know, there's a phrase, uh, excited as a kid in a candy store. I, I just love that idea of watching little kids with wide-eyed excitement. One of the privileges I get to at the church is I get to see a lot of kids being born. Grown up, I've been here for 17 years, so I've seen kids from the time that they were born to the time they've graduated from high school. And I get to play with them, and I coach them in basketball, I coach them in soccer, and I get, I get to experience their life, and, and I get to see them, and I can play with them, I can joke with them, and I am not the principal in the big office. I get to be their pastor that gets to give them high fives, that hugs them, that loves them, that gets to play with them. Sometimes the greatest experience is watching little kids grow up, give their life to Christ, and then the wide-eyed excitement of accepting Christ and following after him, the joy of that is unbelievable. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, I know that nothing is better for you than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. Sometimes we just have to look at our future and say, this is what God has given to me. Let's enjoy it. Let's move on. Do you need to change who you are? You need to change, become like a child and to start living life with excitement about each new day with a new opportunity. You know, those days that those kids come into class for the very first time. I take kindergarten. They come into that class for the very first time. You know who's more worried than the child? The mama. The mama, she's sitting out there, and she's more scared to death. And the kids are, ah, we get to play, we get to do this, we get to do this. And most of the time, you have a couple that's insecure. Most of the time, they're just ready. They're, they're looking forward to what's in front of them. Moms are scared to let go of what they're going to go through. But the, but the teacher's saying, Mom, if you would, if, if you would leave, yes. <laughs> he or she would be fine. Ah, just leave. Stand at the end of the hall. Let the kid play. And now notice that within two or three minutes, that kid's up having fun meeting new friends, and enjoying life. The second thing, a child. To be like a child, you must change by forgiving others quickly. Change by forgiving others quickly. We say this all the time when we were in youth work. If we just let the kids have the fight and the parents don't get involved with the fight, they're going to be playing with each other by recess, right? They may have a little argument. They may fight a little bit. But kids have a good, strong tendency of forgiving and moving on. They can fight and move on. They can argue and move on. Usually it's because of short attention span, but sometimes they really just like to enjoy each other. I remember my buddy, his name was Sam Guy. It's a weird name, but his name was Sam Guy. And uh, we were playing on the playground area in Walmago. We were about probably third grade. He was bigger than me. And we were chasing, you know what you do in third grade, chasing girls around the playground. And he was bigger than me and faster than me, so he got ahead of me. And he won the race, and he caught the girl, and I got mad. So I tackled him. He got up, and we were in, like in the third grade moment of trying to fight, which really patting each other probably is what we were doing. He won. But you know what? We sat right beside each other in class. And as soon as we got back to class, we were cheating off each other, talking to the class. We were just playing. We were upset one moment, and we loved each other and played with each other the next moment, and we never thought about it again. And I believe sometimes we need to be able to forgive and to forget. On our computer, we have a delete button. On our iPhone, who has iPhones? You can delete on an iPhone. You say, delete it. But then it asks you at the end, are you sure you want to delete it because you have to delete it twice? On your computer, you can put it in a trash bin. But before it goes totally away, you say, are you sure you want to empty the trash can? You have to say yes. And there's times in our minds we say, I know I need to forgive. I know I need to delete. But I need to make sure I need to empty the trash bin. Kids have a good tendency of forgiving. They move on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, it says this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It, is, it does not dis honor others. It is self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. It keeps no records of wrongs. Sometimes we need to really just keep no records of wrong. A child's faith, we can take our kids, and they can 
go through some issues. We have to discipline them, but they love us. We have to discipline. Sometimes they get upset, but they have no animosity against us. Children are like little dogs sometimes. You can discipline a dog, and that dog's going to come back and going to lick your hand. It's going to play with you. That child is the same way, and we as adults need to be more like them in the ability to forgive others. To be like a child, you must change by accepting others without prejudging them. Another thing about a child, it makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference where you came from. It makes no difference on your economical status. It makes no difference on where you, what you look at, what you do. They do not prejudge anybody. In verse 4 it says, Therefore whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Prejudice is sin. Judging someone before you know them. And I truly believe that a little child, watching a child, they have no prejudice within their body. Do you know where kids learn to be prejudiced? It is a learned behavior. It is a learned behavior. They are prejudiced because moms and dads are prejudiced. With a little child on the playground, they play. They have fun. They enjoy life. And I believe sometimes we need to be more like them. Wouldn't the city be better? The world even be a better place if we could dig down and scoop out all the smelly prejudice that we have been taught. Will you change and become like a little child and start accepting people regardless of their face, their race, and their place? The kids don't care. They don't ask you where mom and dad went to college. They don't necessarily ask you where you live. They don't ask you how much money you have in your bank account. What they care about is, do you want to play? Do you want to talk? Can we have a good time? We adults need to be like kids when it comes to being prejudiced. Look at people and love them. If, if somebody does something wrong, okay, I'm going to keep you at, at arm's value. We may have to talk about it. We may have to forgive you. But I want to be like a child, and I want to be willing to forgive, and I do not want to prejudge or be prejudiced against anyone. To be like a child, we must recapture the sense of a joyful wonder. Kids are easily fascinated. Kids are easily fascinated. When you look at little kids, the joyful wonder, the, the wide-eyed excitement, the what is happening next. Sometimes adults get the mindset that I've already done that. This is boring. I have to go through the motions again. And wouldn't it be nice if we could go back and forget about the responsibilities and in our faith have a wide-eyed, joyful, optimistic attitude about tomorrow? Not that I have to go through this. Not that I have to deal with this. I can say, if I want to be the greatest, I have to become like a child. If I want to open the door to a future, and not dredgingly, but open it up and say, what can take place? Future's changing. My life is changing. I, this year is changing. I have one boy that's getting married, moving to Kansas City. I have another boy that I'm kicking out of the house, moving to Fort Hayes. Uh, so we have two boys. They're gone. Wonderful. I'm excited about it. <laughs> Praise Jesus. But you know what? It changes. I remember 18 years ago, when I was just a young boy, I had, I had my whole life ahead of me. Now I look back and I'm an older man and everything changes, but I can still be just as excited about the next phase of my life as I was about that phase. But if I get so scared that they are leaving, that I can't enjoy what my future has in store for me, I'm not having that wide-eyed excitement. Whatever phase we're in, whatever problems we're going through, we can say, you know what, this is new. This is a challenge. We can't allow people to determine what we're excited about or what we're fearful about. We have to allow God to give to us that inside, like a little child that says, what's next? What's tomorrow? What's next month? And wake up wondering and have an excitement heart and know that God is going to walk beside us in every area of our life. And to be like a child, you must change by simply Totally trusting in God. Totally trusting in God. One of my favorite things ever is uh, when a little mom and dad brings a child to me. And uh, maybe I was there when the baby was born and, 
and uh, they bring a child in my office. They have, we want, she wants or he wants to talk to you about giving their life to Christ. It's awesome. I said, yeah, I'd love to sit there. Yeah, well, we, we've talked to them, but we just want to make sure that they know what, what's going on. So I sat in the office, and I get to talk to them. And, and a lot of times I get to, to lead a little child to the Lord. And you know, not one time that child has asked me about Calvinism, whether they're a premillennialist. You know what they want to know? Does Jesus love me? Did Jesus just come into my heart? Sometimes we as adults, we overcomplicate salvation. And sometimes we as adults think that kids need to be more like us. But Jesus says we need to be more like them. The faith of a child is what we ask for. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, it says, Do you not know and have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble, stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. We totally must trust in God in everything that we do. Our future has to be totally dependent upon God. Kids have the simple enough faith that they can say, I need Jesus. One of the things when I'm talking to a child, you know, you have to become a sinner before you can become a saint, right? And mom and dads are sitting in the office. I ask a child, I said, now, are you a, are you a sinner? They look at their mom. I said, she's a sinner too. I said, are you, have you ever sinned? Yeah. I said, we're not going to ask for confession. You don't have to tell mom and dad everything you've ever done. But one of the things we have to understand is we have to be a broken individual, understand that we have sinned, and you can't be a saint until you acknowledge your sin. It may not be the deep, miry sin that the adults are in, but that pure little heart of a little innocent child saying, I need Jesus. I need Daddy. Trusting in Him in every area of our life. When you boil it down, salvation is a change. It's a change in direction. It's a change of course. Sometimes change, of course I need change. But some of us, it's just a directional course shift. It's moving the rudder. It's steering the ship in the proper direction, knowing that we may be in the wrong path, but we have to make the proper decisions to put it in the right path. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction, and many will go through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only few will find it. You must turn your sins to Jesus, just like a little child. Not be embarrassed. They are so unaware. They are so innocent. If they know they need to do something, in most cases, they do it. Sometimes our little kids are stubborn. I don't know, anybody have a strong-willed, stubborn child? Sometimes, sometimes they're not so willing to do this, but in most cases, when they know they've done wrong, in most cases, and they've been acknowledged about it, they're broken about it. Sometimes adults are so stubborn I will not do that. I will not do that. I will not bow my knee. I didn't do anything wrong. As we are so self-unaware of what God wants us to do, we are not willing to break our knee towards God. But a child, we need to be more like them. And when a child is known to do wrong, a child says, I am sorry. When an adult is known to do wrong, many times they stand in rejection against that. And what Jesus is saying he goes, guys, be like a little child. Have the faith of a child. Wouldn't it be nice for a while to turn off our phones? To not worry about eating at a nice restaurant? Wouldn't it be nice not to worry about your house payment? Wouldn't it be nice not to worry about your business? Wouldn't it be nice not to have to go to work? Wouldn't it be nice to go back 
to being in third grade? Wouldn't it be nice to have your life ahead of you? Wouldn't it be nice to have no worries? Wouldn't it be nice not to have to worry about a house payment or a car payment or what's going to take place? Wouldn't it be nice to come home to God? Wouldn't it be nice with all the hustle and bustle of life to transport yourself back to a time where nothing mattered except for getting up, going to school, having fun? You know, things change, don't they? Over life, things change. We didn't realize how much change took place. But every event in our life changes everything about us. When you had your first child, it grew us up. We grew up 10 years as soon as we had our first child. It's like, I'm not ready for this, I'm not ready for this. When we graduated from college, or we got our first job, or we had to move out of town, we opened up our business. Every decision that we make and everything that we have changed us to who we are now. Oh, it would be nice to go back to third grade and have nothing. And I know we can't do that. But we can change the way that we perceive our faith in God. Come as a little child with open arms and say, I need God. I don't want to look at somebody with an unforgiving spirit. I don't want to look at somebody with a heart. I want to trust in God. I want to look out of the eyes of an innocent child. The faith of a child can change the adult's heart and life. The open eyes amusement of the future. What am I going through? Why do I have to be scared? Why can't I trust in God about tomorrow? And open the door to the future and say, I'm excited about what tomorrow has in store for me. I can be as a child. I get to go to school. I get to play. I get to enjoy life. I know I have responsibilities. I know there are things I have to do. I know my life has changed drastically. But I know this. If I want to be great, I have to become a child. I have to have the faith of a child. And that faith of a child is saying this. I just need to trust in God. I am where I am because of the choices I have made. The changes I have made in my life, I am here because of those choices. But I can move into the future with a pure heart, with a forgiving heart, with a pure life. And whatever the Lord gives to me tomorrow, I can be just as excited about what I did when I was in third grade because I know I'm a child of God. Change. Of course, it has to be done. But in order to change, we have to make sure our course is set in the right direction. Put our commas where they need to be. My English teacher would just say this. A comma is a pause. Just a pause. It sets clarity. We can read the Bible and we can put our pauses and our emphasis wherever we want. And it changes the interpretation or the way that we see certain things. But God, he wants us to put the pauses in our life in order for us to have boundaries and understand what God wants for our life. So there are times where we just need to put a comma. Put a comma at the end of this year. Not a period. Put a comma. Pause. Lord, what do you want me to do? And when he gives us direction, we can move on to the sentence. But first, we don't need a run-on sentence. We need a comma. We need to pause and say, Lord, what do you want for me to do? I think 2015, 2016, and 2017 are going to be phenomenal if we put God where he needs to be. Comma, Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe that's what God truly is looking for us and excited for our future.